Uh, today is November 10, two 2018. My name is Gabriela Polit, and I'm interviewing Jesus Salvador Treviño for the Voces Oral History Project at the University of Texas at Austin. We are in Austin, Texas again. Thank you, Mr. Treviño, for allowing us to interview you today. Just a reminder, this interview recording will be archived at the Nettie Lee Benson Collection on the UT Austin campus. As we said earlier, if there is anything you don't wish to talk about, we respect your wishes. If, you are, if there are any things you want to talk about, please let us know. We may stop the recording if you need to get a drink or use the facilities, just let us know. Today, we are going to talk about your life in general and more specifically about your experience with documentary filmmaker. Okay. Um, so I want to begin uh, this conversation probably making uh, a question backwards. Many conversations you, in many uh, in interviews you had uh, had before, you talk about how your Docu your your political views influence your film documentary, and I would like to know how the film documentary define your political views. It is like a backwards question. Um, okay, yeah, you know, as you know, I started uh, my career in filmmaking uh, on a picket line with a Super 8 camera. Um, I was part of a film school um, uh, after I graduated from college. Um, uh, with a BA in philosophy, uh, which had nothing to do with filmmaking. But um, I became involved in the Chicano Civil Rights Movement in 1968, and, um, and I went to this uh, technical school, and I picked up a Super 8 camera. They, they taught me how to operate a Super 8 camera. And that's when I would go to community events and protests and film. And at the time, I was one of the very few people there with a camera, a Super 8 camera. Today, um, everyone has an iPhone that they can, you know, film whatever's going on. But in those days, it was a rarity. Uh, so I was there, happened to be there uh, at the right time to do um, the filming of a lot of the events that were going on in the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, and um, the, uh, your, your, uh, your question was about uh, the way in which um, my political views uh, were influenced by, by the filmmaking mm -hmm. or the, the documentary form. Uh, as it turned out, um, when I started filming, um, I was doing it for the political reason that there were events going on that I felt were important events. And one of the discoveries I made was I would film, and uh, the, uh, in those days, a Super 8 camera was a little cartridge that ran for three minutes. And so I'd film for three minutes, and then we'd have to replace it with a new cartridge. Uh, but I would take that material, and I, and I taught myself how to edit um, uh, the material, and I would do these little one and two and three minute movies of the particular event that took place, like a protest, mm -hmm. say, uh, you know. Uh, and then I, I would show it at the community meetings, and I was amazed at the response. Uh, first of all, most of the people would, would do that human thing of saying, I mean, I story, mean, I story, you know. Uh, and, and they would say, you know, there I am on, 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 in this picket line. Uh, so there was a great attention there. But also, what we were doing was that film was being used to recruit and to reinforce the validity of our political action. And that was a great revelation to me that m media could be used in that powerful way to advance a political cause. And that's what got me hooked. And then I said, okay, so this is what we're going to use the media for. And I began to make sure that I was there at a lot of the events. Uh, we had one particular event in um, the summer of 68. Uh, there was a, a sit-in at the Los Angeles School Board. And a number of us, about 100 of us, sat in for seven days and seven nights. We occupied the, the building. We had The place was surrounded by police. The building was surrounded by police. And uh, at the end, a number of us got arrested. Uh, but I was inside with my camera filming it. So I was telling the story from within. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was kind of unique at the time. Uh, and again, with in, in mind the fact that I would wind up doing a, a film, which I did, 
uh, about that event and about the important political struggle that we were engaged in. So in many ways, uh, it was back and forth. The filming reinforced my political views, and the, my political views were advanced by my filming. And that is something that was really new, as you said, at that time, that we have kids doing this with phones now. We were talking before about a, a person that was very close and very important in these sit-downs. Would you like to talk about him a little bit? Sure. Um, at the time, uh, you know, the, uh, the students at the four predominantly Mexican-American high schools in East Los Angeles uh, had been conspiring to, um, to walk out. They were fed up with the way the educational system was treating them. Uh, everything from the abuse of physical abuse. They would swat you uh, for speaking Spanish in the classroom. Uh, but also the more uh, ins insidious way in which the system was failing the students. Um, you were being, if you were a Mexican-American student, you were being tracked into becoming, uh, you know, they knew that you were only going to be a farm worker someday or a factory worker. So they, the idea of going to college was not reinforced or was not, um, you know, um, uh, supported. Rather, uh, they, the students were being channeled into auto repair shop, into woodcraft. Uh, the women were made into homemakers because we knew that women would just grow up to be housewives and, and, or work in, in a factory someplace. And so uh, the, the whole notion of higher education, of aspiring to a career, none of that was re being reinforced. And so uh, we had, as a result of that, we had a, a dropout rate uh, of 50 percent. Fifty percent of the students that enrolled uh, that were enrolled in school from the time they entered high school, only 50 percent graduated. The others dropped out. Uh, they either became, uh, you know, day laborers, uh, or more more commonly, uh, they got involved in gangs uh, and they wound up in prison. Uh, so it was a um, a way in which societally, this whole generation of kids were being channeled into dead end jobs. And uh, our community, uh, my generation, which was the baby boom generation, mm -hmm. we finally came of age in the late 60s. There was a substantial number of us who by, by now, most of us had been born at the conclusion of World War II. And so we were now of age. We were now in our late teens, early 20s. And so now we had large numbers and we decided to say, ya basta. We've had enough of this and we're going to bring about change. And that's why we began with the social protest. And the first of these was the high school walkouts. Uh, they were not just in East Los Angeles, although East Los Angeles was probably the, the first major one. Uh, but then it spread to Texas, to uh, you know, other parts of California, to, to um, um, Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, throughout the Southwest. People got the idea. It was, it was such a, a fiery notion that we could take our destiny in our own hands and bring about social change, and that the first step to do this was to walk out of the schools. And so that began to happen. And, and you, you say to yourself, well, what, what was so important about walking out of a school? Well, in all of these districts, school districts, uh, the school got so much money from the state uh, from the uh, state of California in, in the case of the East LA walkouts, uh, every student who attended school that day would get so much dollars from the state. But if they were not in classroom, they wouldn't get that, that money. So if all of a sudden 2,000 students don't go to school that day, then the state loses, the school district loses all this money. Mm -hmm. And that was how we got them. We got them through the finance. We got them through their pocketbook. We said, we're not going to go to, to attend your schools because you're not giving us the education we need. And so there was this cadre of students that organized. They did the walkouts. And then um, when the walkouts happened, of course, the police came. There was uh, a lot of arrest. And um, there were a group of clergy that stepped in and said, we have to step in and make sure that these students are protected and that they're not arrested. And we have to bring in the parents and help them organize to safeguard the safety of their children. And the leader amongst this 
was um, a Baptist minister named Vahak Mardarosian. And Vahak Mardarosian became the leader of a group called the Educational Issues Coordinating Committee. And this Educational Issues Coordinating Committee, or the EICC, uh, this EICC group became the key organizing group that helped the students organize after the walkouts and help reshape uh, for the school district how we would proceed and how we would bring about these very muchly needed changes. And uh, we formed a group uh, and, and uh, the group included parents, teachers, educators, and students themselves, both high school students and college students. And we all became a committee that moved forward and addressed issues like um, things as, as important as career development, but also simple things like uh, a recognition of Latino, Chicano, Mexicano culture, which was not being taught in the schools. We were denied who we were. And, and so part of what we were about was making sure that uh, we had more uh, recruitment of Mexican-American teachers, educators, uh, counselors, uh, administrators, because we knew that bringing in people with a sensitivity to our culture would, um, would ultimately transform the lives of these children. And we were successful. You were successful. Uh, and yet, in, in, I was reading your autobiography, um, I Witness, great book. And at some point, when you're telling the story of this beginning, you say, well, this is how it began. I might, be cri I have, I might have some criticism about certain things, uh, but that's the way it was. And I would like to, to hear from you, how would you, on the eyes of the events that are happening now, how would you, as a, as a way of giving advice to the new generations, what, what would be your criticisms to, the, to those times, to the things, how they happen at that time? Well, I, I think it was certainly a different time. Uh, it was a different time for, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, um, we were all very much politically involved. Uh, we had been uh, through so much as a community and in our personal lives growing up. I remember being swatted for speaking Spanish. I remember uh, being um, looked down at because of my brown skin or because I was Mexicano. The expectations were, were very low for us. I remember being in a classroom and the white kids were the ones that were called by the teacher for special projects. And all the Mexican kids, we would just be put off to a corner to, to do our, our homework. But the exciting things that were going on were being done by the white kids. And the teacher was consciously or unconsciously uh, saying to us, you don't count, and saying to the white kids that they were recruiting and, mm -hmm. and assigning these special projects to, uh, they were saying, you are the special people. And so I remember growing up that, and what that does is that it creates in you a sense of inferiority. Mm -hmm. You know, if the teacher doesn't recognize you, there must be something wrong with you. We didn't say, oh, the teacher's wrong. The teacher's being racist. We saw, thought, what was wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And, and so, so I, I knew from, that, from experience uh, those kinds of... Um, um, experiences that um, that we had uh, been done to and it was a whole generation of us that spoke out and said we've had enough of this we're going to change it going back to the to the technology or your documentary what was the level of access to media technology among the Chicano at that time um, when, when I started, um, I, I was able to secure, uh, through this uh, technical school that I was attending, uh, a Super 8 camera. But in those days, having a Super 8 camera was, was a rarity. And so often, I'd be at a protest, and I'd be the only person there with a camera. And there might be one or two or three still cameras. But even they were in, um, in low presence. Um, and today, of course, everyone has an iPhone and everyone is a documenter of, of the events around it. You know, whether you're going to a party or you're, you know, you're riding in the car, you, you bring out your iPhone and you photo, you do selfies and all of this. 
But in those days, having that access to a media record of what's going on was a rarity. And so I consider myself privileged in that I was able to be there at the right place at the right time when these events were going on, but with a camera, with a, uh, um, something that I could record it uh, for posterity. You talk about how this also was the material that uh, was included in I Am, I Am Chicano. Mm -hmm. um, and in your book, you talk about how you travel uh, around the Southwest and how the differences of the, of the population, of the Chicano populations. Do, do you want to talk about that and thinking how it changed uh, over the years? How you see the changes from, you know, the beginning, now the world is more connected, the people are more connected. It would well, be an interesting... Yeah, when, when I, I, I did my first major documentary was uh, Yo Soy Chicano. Uh, in 1972, it brought, was broadcast nationally. It was the first film about our community, Latino community, that was broadcast nationally on PBS. And um, at the time, uh, I took a journey throughout the Southwest, throughout Atslan, as we would call it. Um, and, um, and I discovered, to my surprise, that uh, there were many communities in the Southwest. Uh, I had grown up in East Los Angeles, and I knew that reality, but... I would go to New Mexico, and I found out about the rural struggles of, of, uh, of Hispanos in, in that case. I went to Texas and found out about their political struggles in Texas, and I went to Colorado and found that the, the, the people there were so removed from the border that uh, they had, they had to, to focus in on the cultural survival of the Mexicano Chicano in, in, in places like Denver. So I knew that, that the texture of what was going on in our communities was different from community to community, but the one thing that happened was um, there was a very important conference of Latino youth, of Chicano youth, in uh, March of 1969, the Denver Youth Conference, and it was convened by um, a political leader, a, a civil rights leader named Corky Gonzalez, and, and he brought together, there must have been 1,500 of us from throughout the United States who came, uh, including many Puerto Ricans from New York and Chicago, uh, Boricuas who were there uh, to be supportive of the Chicano struggle, but who in their own way were finding their own identity as political people, uh, New Yorkans that, that were getting involved with groups like, um, you know, the, um, the um, what was it? Uh, Anyway, all of us were involved uh, politically, and we came to this to Denver, Colorado. In um, I'll start that again. Um, in in March of um, 1969, uh, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez uh, organized this meeting of Latino youth, and it was the first time that Latinos from throughout the United States had come together in Denver to um, to talk about our identity and to talk about our political struggle. And you had people from, you know, as far away as New York and Chicago, uh, throughout the Southwest, Texas, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, California. And there were about 1,500 of us that came together. And um, we, uh, we met, and at the, there was a big debate about who we were. Uh, many of us uh, were um, identifying as Mexican-Americans, and. I remember there used to be a little button that you wore that said Mexican American because we were trying to identify ourselves. Well, in the course of this one week of meeting of this conference, uh, we realized or we came to the conclusion that we were not Mexican Americans, we were Chicanos. Now, Chicano was a term that had been um, denigrated, had been uh, used uh, disparagingly uh, against Mexicanos for years. And it was a, a way of saying you're a second-class uh, citizen, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're not a, a full American, you're a Chicano, you're, you're nothing. Uh, but we twisted it, and we said, wait a minute, there's nothing wrong with being Mexican-American, there's nothing wrong with, with the, who we are as, as, uh, as a people that have been oppressed uh, societally for years, and there's nothing wrong with us fighting back. And so it was an affirmation of our identity to call ourselves Chicano. And that's why my film was called Yo Soy Chicano. Very proudly saying, there's nothing wrong with about who we are. 
We're proud to be who we are. In many ways, this, this echoed uh, what the, was going on in the African-American community, where people who had been called Negroes were now saying, wait a minute, I am black, and there's nothing wrong with being black. Mm -hmm. And so it was the black power movement. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing our Chicano power movement. And there, there were buttons that said Chicano power. So we were very proud of this identity. And at this conference, um, it really transformed uh, who we were because we all came away from this conference with uh, a recognition that um, the society was saying, go back to Mexico. And we discovered through a poem by um, a, a poet named Alurista, we discovered that uh, the, the concept of uh, uh, Atzlan. And Atzlan was the name given to the Southwest by the uh, Mexicanos uh, at the time of the conquest. Uh, they, they felt that uh, the, the founding of Mexico City uh, was based on a myth, the, the myth of a, an eagle eating a serpent. And the Mexica people had been uh, given this, this mandate uh, that you should look for where this eagle eating the serpent is. And they discovered it on a pile of rocks in the middle of a lake in what is today Mexico City. And they said, that's where we're going to found our city. And that became Mexico Tenochtitlan. And so they built that city from there. But they had come from a place to the north and the west that was called Atzlan. And the legend is that Atzlan was where the Nahuatls lived, and then an earthquake shook the land and dried up the lake, and they had to travel south looking for this myth of this, this symbol uh, of, of the eagle eating the serpent, and eventually they settled in Mexico and found it. That was the myth, the, the, the legend. Uh, well, we took that and we said, well, if that's, that legend is there, that means that we're, we're not foreigners go back to Mexico. We've been here. Our ancestors were here from the very beginning from, you know, hundreds of years ago. And so we embrace that. And so these two concepts, the notion of the term Chicano versus Mexican-American, the adaptation of the term Chicano, and the adaptation of the concept of Atzlan uh, became the one thing that everybody walked away from that conference with. Yeah. And as a result, we all went back to our different homes, whether it was in Texas or New Mexico, Arizona, California, and all the student groups, that had been uh, named after different organizations. In California, it was United Mexican American Students. In Texas, it was Mexican American Youth Organization. Every place you went, they had a different name. We all changed that. We said, we are all going to be Mexicanos uh, de Atzlan, Mecha. And that term, Mecha, which of course in Spanish means match, means, uh, mm -hmm. uh, became a symbol. And pr pretty soon, all of the student groups went under the same name. Mecha. And so it became a radicalization of our consciousness throughout the Southwest, and we became to see ourselves as, an, as a nation state within the United States uh, with this ideology that we were fighting for our rights and that we had to transform America's recognition of who we were. And for the next uh, crucial five to ten years, uh, we brought about this change through a variety of mechanisms, through protests, street protests, through legal filing of lawsuits, through uh, voter registration, um, through uh, a, a number of, of different avenues we pursued, we were able to transform uh, America's uh, ignorance of us into acknowledging that we existed and into changing the laws so that we could have access to the, the equality that we were denied. Mm -hmm. you, you say in the book uh, it was not uh, just that uh, you lost territory in the 1848 war, but the second defeat was that culture and language was taken out of you. And this was both re recuperating the territory and the culture that comes. And I, I always was, has been fascinated by the idea of Aztlan as recuperating that mm -hmm. territory. At the same time, um, there is so much shock or surprise or when you travel for the first time to Mexico City. Uh, you know, there's that tension. We have been here forever and yet the Mexico, speaking about national uh, territory, is always a surprise. It's always somehow a foreign country uh, with a tension there that uh, 
I think it's very interesting to explore. Uh, there, there are many connections of you and your work with Mexico, and I, I think that it will be great to hear from you um, about the first time you went and interview uh, it was Ikeda, uh, yes, yeah. and then what other connections you had in your work as a documentarist and a filmmaker with Mexico. Well, you know, my my first, um, of course, I had. My relationship with Mexico, well, I of course um, uh, had had uh, grown up in the town of El Paso, which is on the border with Juarez, Mexico, and I would spend my summers uh, from the time I was maybe seven, eight years old till the time I was fifteen, sixteen. I would uh, spend the summer there with my grandparents and my cousins in Juarez, and um, and uh, so that was you know one two months out of every year I'd be there with them. Uh, so I, I knew what it was like to be Mexicano because I was growing up there. But as an adult, uh, uh, when I started my filmmaking career, um, I, I had the opportunity to visit Mexico City for the first time. And that was a big revelation. Uh, for me, uh, I had read about the great murals. I had read about uh, the great pyramids and, and all of the, the, the legendary stuff of what Mexico is, the greatness of Mexico. And I had my opportunity uh, for the first time uh, to witness it firsthand. And I remember I was lucky because um, my guide to, to Mexico was a uh, uh, film, um, uh, uh, an art uh, restorer and, and painter named um, Jaime Mejia. And, and he gave me a tour of Mexico, but he did it in a very unique way. He did it historically. And so he took me on a trip from the very early pre Columbian days, and he would take me to those sites. Chichen Itza and uh, Teotihuacan, and, and he would show me these civilizations, and then he would walk us through history, concluding with the, the present day, but go, having gone through the revolutionary period, uh, you know, uh, having gone through, he would take me to the post that still exists of where Posada, the printmaker, would have his office, and, he, and there's a little sign that says Posada, you know. Um, and, of course, uh, he would show me the murals that Diego Rivera had painted, that Orozco had painted, that uh, uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros had painted. And, um, and so I, I, I really got a really great appreciation for Mexican history through, those, through that lens. And then, of course, I was successful in, I, I was doing uh, my first uh, longish documentary called America Tropical, which was about a mural that was painted in downtown Los Angeles in 1932. And I had to go to Mexico City to interview David Alfaro Siqueiros. And that was an eye-opener, too. And I got to meet this great Mexican international muralist. And, um, and it was a, a wonderful experience. And I interviewed him. And, and when we released the film, uh, America Tropical became very, very, um, what's the term? It became very, very um, uh, important, not just for Los Angeles, which is the first time they'd heard that in downtown Los Angeles, in Alvera Street, which is considered this touristy, folkloric place, there was this huge mur mural that had been painted in 1932 that bespoke of the struggles of Latinos. And it was a, a mural of a, an Indian crucified on a double cross. And on top of the double cross was the eagle of the United States currency. And it was clearly a statement, an anti-imperialist statement about U.S. imperialism in Latin America. And of course, not surprisingly, within a week of the mural having been painted, it was whitewashed. And, and it was 40 years later that I came onto the scene in 1969. And in 1971, I completed this half-hour documentary on the story of that mural. And for part of it, I had gone down to Mexico to interview Siqueiros, and it was very successful. And from that um, mural, uh, another 40 years later, we were successful in recuperating the mural that had been almost destroyed, and we were able to salvage it. And today, if you go to Alvera Street in downtown Los Angeles, you'll see the mural is there. It's been um, refurbished, uh, and it, was, uh, it took a lot of uh, money. It was a $10 million project 
funded by the Getty Foundation and the city of Los Angeles. But all of this originated from this one documentary I did in 1971. So I'm very proud of that history and the changes we brought about. Your, your signature should be tiny down there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but going back to, so that, that's been my experience with, with Mexico. But then as a filmmaker, uh, I was invited for the first time in, uh, I believe, 74 to Mexico City to show my, my, my documentary films. And it was my introduction to the community of Mexican uh, filmmakers. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that led eventually to my first uh, feature film, which was made in Mexico, Raices de Sangre, Roots of Blood. And, uh, and it was largely through, um, uh, when I did the film, uh, I had the support of many of the Mexican filmmakers that I had met in that early trip in 74. Uh, I, was, uh, I made the film in 76, and it was broadcast, uh, it was released theatrically in Mexico in 79, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while there, they, it, was, it was censored because it was a pretty political film. Uh, but eventually, it, it did see the light of day. Um, and, um, and it was a little visionary because uh, the film Raices de Sangre begins with the discovery of a truckload of Mexican immigrants uh, on a Texas highway who have, been, who have uh, died of asphyxiation and they've been abandoned there. And sadly, this event continues to the present mm -hmm. uh, to take place. Uh, but in 76, uh, I had read about this taking place and so I made that the opening of the film. And, um, and, and so um, in, in many ways, the, the film focuses on the organization of a bilateral union of Mexican factory workers and U.S. Chicano factory workers who unite to form an international union. Mm -hmm. and, and this was, of course, very revolutionary at the time uh, and uh, the bad guys, uh, the antagonists in this story, were the U.S. multinational corporations that were exploiting the workers on both sides of the border, uh, something that can continue to this day. Mm -hmm. So again, it was prophetic in that sense, and, and because of its political content, uh, it, it, once the film was finished, uh, the, the, uh, the presidency um, uh, of López Portillo um, put it, on a shelf and said, this film is not going to be theatrically released. But uh, we were successful in releasing it because um, another film had made a big splash in Hollywood at the time, uh, Boulevard Nights. Mm -hmm. And the star of Boulevard Nights was a guy named Richard Enigas. And Richard Enigas was the star of my movie, uh, Raices de Sangre. And so we went to the Mexican government, uh, to the distributor of the films, and we said, you look at this film with Richard Inigas starring in it, and it's making millions of dollars, and you guys have this film with him starring in it, and it's on a shelf. You're not releasing it. You're, you're way, you, you, know, you could be making money off of this. And, and money spoke. <laughs> and so sure enough, they said, okay, you're right. We will release it. And they did nationally. And in the United States, they did a subtitled version so that both uh, Mexicanos but also Chicanos many of the, whom could not understand Spanish, they needed to see an English mm -hmm. subtitled version. And so the film found great success. I remember we had a premiere of it uh, in East Los Angeles, and, and Cesar Chavez came and attended and opened the, 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 uh, the screening. Wow. Uh, and because, of course, he was involved with the labor struggle of Mexicanos in the fields. And, and, um, and, I, and it was one of the things that I raised in, in, um, in, the, uh, in the film was, was the, uh, the, the worker struggle. And so he, he found identification with that and he was very supportive of the film. And, and so that was, that was great to see that success finally. And this was 79 by then when the film was finally released. I'm happy to say that in, in, at the quincentennial uh, the 500 year, uh, an I'm happy to say that at the 500 year anniversary of the conquest uh, in, in 1992, um, there was a um, film festival in Spain and they selected the 25 most important films of Latin America, pulling from Mexico, Chile, Argentina, from all over Latin America 
And one of those 25 films was my film, Raices de Sangre. I, I think that um, th this is something that um, I wanted to, to talk about. Um, your relationship with other Latin Amer American filmmakers, uh, your relationship w with uh, Mexico began when you interviewed Cicada, and then you talk about this movie. And there was this anti-imperialism that was, uh, you know, in all the region. And I would like to know uh, your contacts with Cuban filmmakers, Mexican filmmakers, other uh, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Well, m my first visit to, as a filmmaker, to Mexico was in 1974 when I was invited to be part of a conference on, um, on international um, Latino filmmakers. And um, I met, for the first time, not only Mexican filmmakers of the time, uh, people like Sergio Oljovic, Alfonso Arrao, um, Jorge Fons, um, um, Paul Leduc, uh, various other Mexican filmmakers that were then uh, the up-and-coming generation. But also, I, I, I met uh, Chileans like Miguel Latin, and I met uh, Colombians and, and uh, Peruvians and people from all over Latin America. And it was, for me, a, a big revelation. And one of the things it did for me personally was to um, understand the universal aspect of labor and of class struggle in the Americas. And there was an affinity between what, what I was unconsciously doing as a Chicano filmmaker documenting the farm workers movement, for example, or, or the political uh, movement in, in, in the Chicano world, like La Raza Unida, for example. There was an affinity with that, with what was going on in other countries, unbeknownst to me. And so uh, I could see how people were now looking at my work and saying, this is the same as what's going on the documentaries that are being made about, you know, the Chilean struggle or, or the Argentines uh, or, you know, the, the kind of repression that was going on in many of those countries. So there's a real affinity there. And uh, among the people that I met in Mexico City was uh, the Cuban filmmakers uh, Miguel Torres and um, Julio uh, Garcia Espinosa. And, um, and they and um, uh, Raul um, um, Yelin, uh, who was um, the, Cuban uh, the Cuban ambassador to Mexico City. And, um, and he, he, I got to know him, and, and through that channel I was invited to, to Cuba. And uh, I went several times, and um, of course in those days it was verboten for a U.S. citizen to go there, so I had to go through all these changes to get down there. But, uh, needless to say, I did attend, and we formed a group uh, in Havana called El Comité de Cine Cineastas de Nuestra América. And this was a group of filmmakers from throughout the Americas uh, that, that were doing political work, much of it documentary, uh, related to the different struggles that were going on in Latin American countries. And we realized that the scope of the, we're looking to the future, we realized that there would be many filmmakers in the coming generations uh, dealing with political themes and social themes in Latin America and that we had to kind of harness that energy and, and find a way of promoting our filmmaking. And so we decided as a committee that we had to go beyond just being a small committee, that we had to form an international film festival. Uh, and so we created in 1979 uh, the first uh, International Film Festival in, of Latin American Cinema, of New Latin American Cinema in Havana. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the founders of that group. And, and w I took a delegation of uh, 17 or 18 Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, uh, to Havana, and we brought our films. And we were able to screen them not only in the theaters uh, that they had there in Havana, in downtown Havana, uh, but also, we would take them out to the countryside, to, to barrios in, in the neighborhoods, and we would put up a, uh, a sabana uh, a sheet, and we'd bring our projector, and we'd screen our documentaries to the local people. And they, of course, loved it, and we'd get involved in dialogues with them about what we were doing with our, with our filmmaking. 
And so, uh, so it was a really great moment. And of course, that festival, the, the uh, International Film Festival, New Latin American Cinema, continues to this date. Uh, every December they have this, this uh, film festival. And, it, and it's, been, it's an international group, so you have filmmakers from all over Latin America who, who come and, and who exchange ideas and who do production deals and distribution deals. So it's been very forward-looking, but it all came from this little committee that we formed in, I believe it was 75, 76. Would you say that in the, in the coming years in your filmmaking, uh, those experiences back in Latin America uh, feed or enlarge your views of how you had to portray those realities that were happening here with the Chicana community? How the conversation back and forth was when the reality you saw was not just the local Chicano community, but as you said, the Americas was... Well, I think wh when I first started doing um, my early films, like America Tropical, uh, like Yo Soy Chicano, it was very, they were very nationalistic films. Uh, and my documentaries, like La Raza Unida, were very nationalistic oriented toward being Chicano. And what my knowledge and interchange with other Mexicans, other Latin Americans, certainly with the Cubans, it opened my eyes to the fact that the, of class consciousness. Uh, it opened my eyes to the fact that the Chicano experience was similar and a part of the larger struggle that was going on throughout the Americas about identity and about political struggle and political in, uh, empowerment. And I realized that my filmmaking had to reflect that. And so I began to shy away from just nationalistic uh, projects and look at material that was a little bit more universal and, and, and went to the underlying unities of our world struggles. And, um, and this became kind of evident to me when um, I accepted the job of being executive producer for a national... PBS um, children's show called Infinity Factory. And this was curious because um, I remember when I was uh, offered the job, um, I agonized over it because I had just done, uh, I, I, was in the, I was about to start uh, writing uh, my feature film, Raíces de Sangre. And, and I really felt, you know, I'm going to be a drama director, which I've become. But at the time, I was still very much a documentary filmmaker and um, and and but you know I saw this as an opportunity and I remember having conversations with my colleagues at the time uh, my good friends uh, Adolfo Vargas uh, David Sandoval they were my my consulary they were the ones who were always giving me advice and they were saying Jesus this is a big opportunity for all of us because you have the opportunity to shape on the American public about who we are and not just us as Chicanos, but Puerto Ricans, blacks, African Americans. You know, you could, this could have a big impact. And so I accepted the job, and one of the things, although it was a, 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 a series that was uh, supposed to be teaching mathematics to children uh, 12, uh, well, um, 12 years old to 15 years old, um, what we really did was we taught math but also I included a section on cultural values. And I began to teach the history of third world leaders. Everybody from Cesar Chavez to um, the African Americans that had designed the street layout of Washington, D.C., to, to various uh, political leaders, to, to China, to, all, to, to show that what the United States was about was not just white people, but was about third world people, was about people of color, was about uh, the history of all the contributors to what is America. And so that became a really, at the time, uh, people were like, well, what does this have to do with mathematics? Well, it has everything to do with mathematics. And, and I was able to show how mathematics was utilized by these great political leaders to advance the human race, to advance the human consciousness, to advance the values of humanity. And, uh, and that show, we did 52 half-hour shows. And it, it was successful, it won uh, awards. 
And, uh, and that to me was a, a really acknowledgement of the, the need that to, that's when I really um, crystallized uh, my understanding that what I was about was not just a parochial Chicano filmmaker, educator, but a, an American filmmaker with a commitment to all of the, what America is today, not just U.S. America, but the Americas. Mm -hmm. And, and that was, uh, I, I think I, I've followed since then to try to, to keep that balance in mind. I, I think that all you say is so interesting because you are the life experience. <laughs> Your life is the experience of all these changes. Um, I would like to, to go back to a, a question that may, might be very limited, but how do you see politics in your views, how, in technical terms, let, let's say uh, genre, the TV, the documentary, and the film, how, how each of these uh, means of giving your messages change or shape the political ideas you have? And I'm thinking of, uh, young professionals who are deciding which is the best way to say what I want to say. What, in your experience, how, how that worked? Well, one thing I've discovered uh, as a, in my career as a filmmaker, you know, beginning with documentaries and then moving into drama, long-form drama, and then the past 35, 40 years or so has been um, episodic television, um, is that there really is um, a difference in, in how you approach your career and the opportunities. Um, I, I discovered early on that um, as a documentary filmmaker, yes, you're, you can do a film about what you believe, about your vision of what's going on, say, in the Latino community or in the world community, but that it's limited by finances and it's limited by the resources you have. And, and I think part of that, of course, stems from the fact that um, you can, you know, uh, commercially, uh, people want entertainment. And many of these documentaries, I wouldn't characterize necessarily, although they may be entertaining, you may not view them as entertainment per se. They're more educational, didactic. Um, and so you're limited to somewhat degree there. When you get into the commercial sphere, um, you have more opportunity to express yourself in terms of the outreach to a large audience when you do, for example, direct an episodic television show. But you're not in the driver's seat. Although you're the director, you're basically adhering to a script that already has been written by someone else whose goal it is for entertainment. And um, although you may be able to get some political jabs in there or or sensitize it with your understanding of the human condition or with your understanding of the social political realities uh, ultimately your job is to do an entertaining piece of television and if you get uh, these points in there now and then that's great but basically if you can't entertain you're failing and you're going to get fired and you know you, you're not going to get hired again so it's a different ball game entirely and, and I've been able to balance the two by, by acknowledging that um, you have to pay respect for each of the genres and what's expected of them. And so I've done a lot of, do of my, my television career has been about entertainment in the Hollywood sense. But concurrent with that, uh, I have allowed myself the opportunity to do my own films, documentaries, where I can express my political views more openly and where I can uh, have my films uh, address what I consider to be the social concerns of my community, the Latino community. That's how I've balanced it. I don't think you can do both. I, 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 think, uh, uh, I think if you're doing a documentary, you've got to play by those rules. If you're doing commercial TV, you've got to play by those rules. I've been very fortunate because most people don't get the opportunity to play in those two spheres. The shift 
from being a documentary filmmaker to being a drama filmmaker is very hard to accomplish. Many people never, can never get it because uh, the, the concerns that when, when you're being hired to direct uh, primetime television, they say, well, what have you done in primetime television? And you say, well, all I've done is documentaries. And they say, well, you're not qualified. We're not, we don't want you to do a documentary. We, we want to know the people. We want to hire people who already have a long track record of doing drama, of doing episodic TV, or we're not going to hire you. Uh, and so doing that bridge, that shift to... Um, to drama, uh, to commercial drama, to, to episodic TV is, is a difficult one that I was successful uh, in, in, uh, in making. And, um, and, you know, sadly, in Hollywood today, uh, the exclusion of uh, minority directors it continues to this date. We're, we're very much in a minority. And, um, and I think if you look at Latinos in episodic television today, uh, we continue to be just a handful compared to, you know, there are something like 15,000 members of the Directors Guild of America, and of them, there's maybe a dozen or 15 that are Latinos that work regularly in episodic TV. Yeah, so all, <laughs> all, these, all these paths that you walk and a little accomplished there, um, I... Um, I have several questions that I would like to put together. One is how you see uh, the change of the Chicano and the Latino community from when you start now. Um, because I think that the Latino community is now more defined on a way of consuming things as consumers. And I would like to, since you were at the beginning of fighting for this identity, how you see this shift into an identity that was claiming a political place and a territory and a language, how the industry transformed this somehow, uh, the Hollywood industry, transformed this into a targeted population for, of consumers. Do you see that in... in well, yeah, um, I, I think you have to, I think it's fair to say that um, in the 60s, when this activism was, the Chicano political activism was taking place, it was in response to um, great injustices, and, um, and it was a civil rights movement. Um, and part of our success was that many of the people who were disenfranchised at the time once these changes were brought about, were able to attain jobs and careers in society. And therefore, they were no longer the, the squeaky wheel because they now had a path for their success. And also, at the time, although we did represent large numbers, the actual people who brought about the social change were really a minority. But a minority can do a lot, and it can transform a societal understanding. And today, I think, um, I, I look at the contemporary generation of Latinos, uh, and part of it is um, that uh, we become somewhat complacent, uh, because although we still have a lot of political issues that are hard fought and that are very difficult, such as immigration, for example, I mean, the very fact that we can have children being kept in cages is unconscionable. And then you say, well, why aren't the majority of young people in America, ra you know, rising to the, you know, yelling to the, to the ceilings about this great injustice? Well, because most young Americans are, whether you're Latino or not, are complacent. They're going to parties, they're getting their education, uh, they're involved in, you know, football, baseball, they're doing this, doing that. And, and these realities become, you know, something that you hear about but that doesn't really involve you. You see, and, and in the days of the Movimiento, of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, we were very much embraced those issues. Those very issues were issues that we embraced because we had lived them. We knew what it meant 
to be poor. And I think a lot of the success of the movement, the success of the civil rights movement has been in a sense that current generations are somewhat um, mollified by, by the way things are today. Um, they, they have affluence um, and the things we were protesting about, um, I think today's generation don't need to protest about them because some of these, the changes that we were arguing for have come about and we've made a better America and we've made it a better America for Latinos. And so although we still have these great injustices going on, a lot of the Latinos today accept the world as, as it was given to them and don't understand that maybe there's some things they ought to be looking at. And I, I do think that, again, a small minority can make a big impact. And I'm looking to the day when younger generations of this era um, look to the social concerns that still exist and say to themselves, I need to be part of this change. And if enough of them, of this minority, enact change, it will impact on the rest of society as a whole, not just the Latino community, but America. Yeah, it is uh, interesting to to comment to this thing that you just said that uh, comparing these or analyzing uh, in an analogy with how exceptional it was for you to film all these things with the Super 8 and how common it is to film everything. It is kind of a metaphoric translation of the exceptionality of being able to show what was going on and now people being used to film whatever is going on. So also that, that line of representation that was so important back then has vanalized, you know, some, somehow. Well, I, I would say this, that um, when I started, um, access to the media was a rarity. And we had a great message to tell, a message of injustice, a message of the need for social reform. Uh, and we were using the media to that end. Today, the technology is that everyone is a filmmaker. Everyone can pull out their iPhone and film a video of whatever happens to be going on in their lives and post it on Facebook. And everyone is a filmmaker and the platforms are, are international. Are, everyone can see it. But uh, I do think that, um, that the content, uh, in many ways, um, you need to look at that. And we were arguing for very, very important social content. And as I say, that social content and those social themes and those injustices, like the immigration story, continue to this day. And, uh, but a lot of young Latino Americans I think either are unaware of them or don't see them as a priority. And, um, and instead of taking that iPhone and doing a selfie, they don't take that iPhone to film young immigrant children in cages and say, why is this going on? What can we do to change it? And, uh, but I have hope that, this, that there are people within this younger generation who will see that need and who will realize the potential they have at their disposal. And I see it with a lot of young filmmakers today. You know, the, the one thing that I, I've created my website, Latinopia, and I did it uh, because I wanted to show that our future is on the internet. That you don't have to make Hollywood features or episodic TV to express the Latino reality. That you can take your iPhone or your small camera and make a documentary or make a drama and put it on the internet and, and uh, create a website. And you can take your message, your Latino message, and make it available to all of, not just America, but all of the world through the internet. And so this is a vital opportunity that we have. And there are many young Latino filmmakers who are availing themselves of this opportunity. They're creating their own uh, mini-series, their own dramas. And uh, if they're lucky, they can get on a Netflix or on an HBO or some of these places. But if they're, if they're not so lucky, they can still be heard by creating their own you know, website and, and creating their blogs and, 
and making their videos available on the internet, that platform. And that's why I created Latinopia to show, you know, here's Latinopia, here's this website I created where we have 500 videos of who we are as Latinos. And one man did it, one person did it. What are you doing? You can do the same thing. You know, and with Latinopia, I film it, I edit it, I upload it. One person. And I don't have exceptional skills. And they're skills that anyone can, can learn. You can learn how to shoot a camera, you can learn how to edit. Uh, younger generation people know it by the time they're 15 or 16 years old. They already know how to do a movie. Because that access to that technology comes early on. And uh, the future generations are going to continue to do that. I mean, there are kids today who are 12, 13, who already know how to make their movie. And you look at the future and you're thinking, what kind of movies are they going to be making 10, 15, 20 years from now? Do you see in these productions of uh, young generations that the politics is there, that there is an ideological aspect? Um, or do you see that many of these films are more depoliticized? Well, I think one of the greatest threats to the progress of Latinos in America is the complacency that sets in as generations grow up in privilege and um, ignore or are ignorant of the, the injustices that continue to exist um, not just in the United States, but in the world. And um, many of them are, are complacent to the point where they just are about their career, about their life, and don't bother me with anything that's happening to, f with anyone else. And it's sad that that complacency exists. Uh, it's a natural outcome of the privilege of not being oppressed. If, if all these young people were working in the fields, I can guarantee you they've become very politicized. But fortunately, they haven't. Fortunately, they are getting an education. Fortunately, they are able to go to college, many of them. And then and they're, they, they're able to shape their careers. But all of this, I think, winds up becoming uh, a real, you know, interesting um, uh, paradox because whereas they have all this affluent ability and uh, you would expect them to be more open to where you don't see that, to the moments of injustice that continue today. And yet, so many of them ignore it. Now, I'm a very hopeful person. Uh, I've seen what can, what can bring, be brought about by a handful of people. I lived through the 60s. I saw that social change brought about. I saw it start from virtually nothing, from the oppression that we had, um, you know, whether it was, you know, the high dropout rates and sending our kids to gangs and being imprisoned and all these terrible things that uh, were going on, you know, prior to the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and I've seen how we've managed to make these major societal changes. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the current generation will be able to at some point, despertar. At some point, look at themselves and say, why aren't I helping here? You know, there's more to life than affluence. There is more to life than being a consumer. Uh, there is more to life uh, than ignoring uh, my fellow human being and reaching out to him or her and trying to make their life better. And you know, I, I think uh, I preach, if you will, I share my ideas of community responsibility, of realizing that we're, you know, we're not an island um, in the universe. We are uh, a, a community of people, and whether you're Latino or African American or Asian or, or Caucasian, all of us are human beings, all of us are Americans. And we have within us the ability to define what is an American. And we must struggle to define that Americanness in terms, social terms and political terms and identity terms. And we must fight against the kind of balkanization 
that the uh, current administration is trying to force. The, the, the balkanization of us versus them, the, um, the attempt to say that, uh, you know, America is all white and that if you're not white, you're not an American. And, and that is, you know, the, the campaign slogan of uh, Donald Trump uh, has been, let's make America great again. But the subtext of that for so many people is, let's make America white again. And we have to fight against that. And it's going to be the younger generation of Latinos, African Americans, whatever, who are going to embrace that and say, no, we, we need change. And I'm happy to see... Um, more recently, we've had the Beto O'Rourke uh, candidacy. And it was young people that saw that, that said, this is the change we need. And I'm hopeful because I think that what Beto O'Rourke and people like Beto O'Rourke represent is a new consciousness that says, this is what it means to be American. And the identity question, whatever your identity is, is part of it. But, but we, we want an America where we're about human values, about progressive values. We want a, an America that is not putting children in cages, that is not calling people rapists when they're not, that is not all of the, the, the things, that is not, um, uh, you know, labeling women uh, by, by names and, and, um, and, and this misogynistic uh, look at, at who we are as Americans. Uh, you know, all the terrible things that, have, that the uh, Trump administration has done. And so I'm hopeful that we will be bringing about that new America, or that re regaining, recapturing the America that has always been there, but that in this dark time has been allowed to be foreshadowed by the worst in us as human beings. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop it there because otherwise I'll go on for hours about the Trump administration and how it's the, precursor, it's the same precursor to fascism that Hitler did. I, I, I wanted to wrap up our conversation um, talking about the political, um, the political times that we live and the way that identity politics plays or, or doesn't play. Uh, for or against this kind of rhetoric that we're attacked by um, and how people in the industry you work can respond to that to that um, you kind of <laughs> gave some ideas but you, you might want to expand on that because I, I do think that tension of identity politics has been something very important and at the same time it could be, you know, um, detrimental sometimes for some struggles, political struggles. And I, I think that representation, which is basically your field you're representing, has a, lo a lot of potential. What you say about the, the Latinopia is so important because it's a, uh, uh, what is the the word um, a place to show that the struggles of these people with their own identity, but uh, there is a tension there. I I don't know if I'm my, making myself clear. Well, I think um, you know I, I think that uh, as Americans, I, I look at it you know on, on a larger scale of you know what is American, what it, what are what are we as Americans? And, and fundamentally, I think we represent human values. And, um, and these are universal values that I think our country has not always had. And, um, you know, if you go back to the, you know, the founding fathers, you know, where women were not allowed to vote and where African Americans were, were not even considered citizens. Or not con and we made a lot of progress. Uh, but that progress uh, continues is a work in progress. Uh, that 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 progress, that human progress, is something that continues to get better and better. We hope, but within that is always the danger of it going south, of us forgetting our ideals, and that is a hard-fought um, 
uh, notion that we have to protect those ideals and we have to be always alert that uh, these human ideals and um, humanistic values of what America, the great potential for what America is, that it never get, um, you know, um, sidetracked. And, um, and I think that um, we've had this, we are having this big challenge during the Trump uh, years in, in, in it showing, demonstrating how vulnerable Americans can be uh, to this sidetracking and to this um, diminishing of the humanistic values of who we are and how easy it is uh, for the um, Americans and a large bulk of them, a large number of them, uh, to become subverted and to allow their worst aspect uh, to come to the fore. Their, um, their hatreds, their fears, and to be manipulated. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the danger, I think, in identity politics is when the identity politics become racist politics. That is the key. You can be proud of who you are, but everyone needs to be proud of who they are as part of the larger fabric of what America is. That's what makes America great. But the minute that you're being proud makes you hate someone else because they're not like you, that's where this racist policy comes in. And, and I've seen that. I've tried to stop it whenever I see it in my community. Sadly, when the Internet first came on, we had a couple of, I remember, um, websites created by Latinos, by Chicanos, who were very, you know, pro Atslan, but were basically racist sites. Hate the gringo, you know, um, hate the Jews, yeah. hate the gays. And I was shocked that Chicanos would, that, that, but that's where they were. And, and that's what, the, they were so threatened by, by having to affirm their Chicano ness that the only way, uh, they were so insecure that the only way they could have a sense of security was by attacking out the outside, attacking others, m diminishing their reality. And that's what we have to be careful of. And so I, f I fought to, you know, put these people down because we, we you know, uh, it, it, to me, being Latino, being any ethnic group is all about the commonality of the human experience yeah. and the openness to, to brothers and sisters of color um, of, of people, you know, where we're all under the skin, we're all the same human beings. And, um, and that to me is the real challenge today is that um, Americans um, of all stripes, of all colors, need to keep that in mind and be wary of those leaders that would say, you're very special, but the only reason you're special is because you're not like him or you're not like her and you have to hate those people. That's the big danger. And unfortunately, we have a person in the White House who promulgates that, yeah. who thrives on that. And that's what we have to stop. And I, I do think that th this question is very pertinent, thinking about migration, because one of the things that strikes me a lot is to see Latino or, or you know, Latino Americans, uh, Latino in, in the U.S. fighting against migrants as if they were different. And, and uh, in that sense, I, uh, I, I completely agree with you. These, the, the crisis of migration is a humanitarian crisis. And, and you see white people being afraid, you don't understand. But when you see Latinas being afraid or, or, or not uh, empathic with that for, to keep their identities yeah. It's striking. Well, compassion. I mean, wh where, do, where do we as Americans lose our compassion? And there are people who see these children in cages and say, that's okay. It's what, it's what it takes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that one of the, the things that we've seen in the recent elections is the good news 
that there are so many Americans of all, from all backgrounds who have said, no, we, we need to have compassion. We, there is a better America. We are about a, a better, better America, and we're going to vote to bring that about. You know. I, I don't know if you saw my, my uh, vote for uh, Hope Now video. No. I'll, I'll show it to you. It's a little five-minute piece I did uh, to get out the vote. Uh, I put it on the Internet. Uh, and it's it's very much about um, how we need to, to change America, you know, within, from within, through the political electoral process, uh, but basically how we, we have to take uh, America's uh, future into our own hands. Uh, that's the only way we're going to be able to secure um, a lasting uh, permanence. And, and we have a long struggle because of all the um, division in the country. Uh, you know, how do we unite that? Uh, we, we have to get to that, and, and it has to uh, include the leadership, and sadly the le leadership has been so bereft, has been uh, so, you know, dropping the ball on it, uh, that they've become the worst perpetrators of that, those divisions. Yeah. Let, let me get back to, to the industry. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think... Um, that Latinos are still a small minority in the film and TV industry. There are many other areas in which that change. Education, for example, we see tons of Latino kids going to college. Um, but what is it about the film, the field of film on, on TV and industry, that it's so close? Well, I think the, the fundamental problem with the lack of Latinos in the U.S. film and television industry rests on the fact that like, unlike any other enterprise or industry, education, sports, um, whatever, the, the ability to equalize is channeled through um, a small number of people. And the environment within which these people, and I'm talking about Hollywood producers, um, you know, writers, the universe that they live in is very insular. Um, and it's been that way historically for decades. And how do you break into that? How do you transform that? Well, um, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, uh, you, you know, you can point to statistics and, and you look at um, for example, directors or writers in American television or, or cinema, They're, they represent 2 or 3 percent of the population who are Latinos. And in any other societal arena, the fire department, the city government, if you had a population in Los Angeles you know, the population is over 50% Latino. In Hollywood, it's over 50% Latino. And yet, if you had the fire department with over 50% Latinos and only 1% or 2% were, La were Latino firemen, there'd be lawsuits. It's injustice. It's, it's discrimination. The same thing within education. The same thing in any other field. But in Hollywood, it's business as usual. And it's because everyone in the industry they work together. Um, so much of it depends on who you know, your contacts, the agency um, system um, is geared to reinforcing um, the, ex the existing status quo. And so to just to break in is a huge accomplishment. But not only do you need people to break in, you need to create a, a groundswell of many people to reinforce and to build a community that then can be part of the greater Hollywood community. And African Americans, to a larger degree than Latinos, have been successful in this. Uh, Latinos have not been so successful. Uh, that is to say, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, in my experience, in my directing, whenever I direct, like when we did, for example, Resurrection Boulevard, we went to great uh, lengths 
to make sure that the, the crewing mm -hmm. of our production, the, the camera people, the wardrobe people, the makeup people, the, the lighting technicians, the sound tech, we made a big thing of trying to integrate uh, people of color and Latinos uh, into that and create that little uh, community within a community. Uh, and that's what I think we need to do to, to build a force uh, because if, if you work once every two or three years, we're never going to make an impact. But if you're working regularly, because you're going from this show to that show to this next show, because you have, you're building a track record, that's how we bring about societal change in Hollywood. And that's been very slow in coming. And again, I, I point to the nepotistic way in which Hollywood um, works. Uh, if you get hired to, um, to do a show, uh, you know, it, we, we've done a long struggle, for example, within the acting community to have a presence of people of color on television. You know, remember that in the 70s and 80s, uh, you didn't find uh, Latinos on the commercials. You didn't find black people in commercials. It was all white. And now, finally, you look on your television and you find the newscasters are people of color. The weather people are people of color. Um, you look at commercials and whether they're selling insurance or whether they're selling, you know, dog food, they're people of color finally. So we've made some progress in that respect. With the actual production of things like episodic TV and, and Hollywood features, it's much more difficult and, and it's a slow process. And the important thing, I think, is, is just not to get discouraged. Um, today, I, I look at the younger generations and, and I think I tell them that you have to examine what exactly do you want to do in the industry? Because there's some avenues that I would not advise pursuing. Like you know? what? Well, episodic television, for example. It's so difficult to get in and, and it's so cutthroat um, that, you know, if you are Latino and you have something to say, maybe there's other avenues for you to do it. Maybe it's creating your own films for the Internet. Maybe it's you making your own uh, films, documentaries, or dramas uh, as an independent filmmaker. You know, um, just because Hollywood is there doesn't always mean we have to go to it. And I'm speaking as someone who's been there for almost 50 years. So I'm saying Hollywood is not all that. And uh, to my mind, uh, I consider myself fortunate in to have been able to participate in the Hollywood experience, but not lose my Latino identity and my contributions to my community in the process. I've always maintained that as my goal, not to forget where I'm from and to continue to contribute and now that I'm retired from television directing, I'm doing it even more so through my website, Latinopia, and in other ways as well. Um, I, I told you at the beginning that I come from the literary field. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you say that you wanted to write a big novel like A Hundred Years of Solitude. You are a great writer. I love your book. I'm, I'm hoping you continue writing the second part, you said. Um, have you read any of my short stories? I have not. Okay, well, I have three collections of short stories. And I've taken one of them and I've made it into a play, a 90-minute play. Um, and so I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing... Um, th that's a whole other area now uh, of, of my creativity has been through the writing. Um, and... Um, I, I have, I, I fantasy sometimes of, of doing a novel, although the reality of it is I'm also counting the, uh, the time I have left. <laughs> when you get to be my age, um, you know the clock is ticking. And you have to ask yourself, what is reasonable to do between now and the time I, as they say, shuffle off this mortal coil? Um, I, I think I have to be very selective about the projects I get involved in. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, uh, we were discussing earlier about uh, documentaries, and the one thing about documentaries 
is, you know, it takes you five, six years, seven years to do a documentary. And um, if you're in your 20s, you can count in one hand the number of films you're going to make before you're 60 or 70 and ready to retire. And so for myself, you know, would I like to take on a six or seven year project to do another documentary? I don't think so. I, I've done that already. And, um, and I, you know, and I, I've been through the process. It takes a lot out of you. And I just am not ready to do that anymore. And the same applies to things like considering a novel, which is, you know, five to ten year project. Do I have that left in me? I don't know. You know, I, I don't know I want to take on that struggle yet. So, you know. But how would, how would you compare as a creator uh, the grammar of words and the grammar of images for you, for you personally? Well, I think the writing is uh, such a more personal experience. It's just ultimately it's just you and the typewriter, the computer, the pencil. And uh, which gives you a great deal of freedom. Uh, if you do your homework, you can express a lot using that vehicle. Uh, you're less dependent on other people. You know, I come from an episodic television background. When I'm on the set as a director, I have 100 people working for me. And the success of my project is going to depend on the success of these 100 people. So if my sound man's asleep at the wheel, there's not going to be good sound. If the cameraman doesn't know how to focus the camera, there's not going to be good good image. Uh, the same applies to wardrobe, makeup, everything. So all these people have to be on the money doing their job right for us to get a good product, right? And the money helps because the money assures that only the best people get to that point. Um, but when you're writing, it's just you. And your commitment and tenacity and creativity focused in on yourself and on the, your vision of what you want to say. There's a lot more uh, flexibility on that. I enjoy it in many ways. Um, it's in a different way that you enjoy it than working in television because television is such a social activity. I interact with people all the time. Um, and, and so it becomes very much an interactive process, whereas in writing it's just you. And you're doing less, even if you get consejos from other writers or whatever. Ultimately, it's just you as the creator and, and the work you're working on. So there's much more liberty and much more, um, uh, what's the term, responsibility. Because you can't blame it on anyone else. <laughs> it's just, you know, either your, your, your writing is good or it isn't, you know. But um, I, I kind of value that. And one of the things I'm doing now that I'm retired from episodic television directing is spending more time writing. Lucky us. <laughs> Thank you. I think that um, uh, it has been a great uh, conversation. I I learn a lot from you, and I I was lucky to be here sitting talking. Well, to thank you. you for for the good questions. No, I. Well, thank you. Is there anything? Is there anything you want to talk about um, to say at the end? Um, stays with bosses that will be... Um, uh, I think, um, you know, I've been doing Latinopia. I've been interviewing a lot of um, um, people that are elderly in years. People like Dolores Huerta, mm -hmm. uh, people like Rudy Anaya, uh, and um, I ask them, the last question I always ask them is, um, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, because sadly, uh, I'm saving these. And uh, as has happened when um, they pass away, like the Reverend Vahak Mardarosian that we spoke about earlier, um, I'm able to go into my archives and find their response to that question, how do you want to be remembered? And I post it on Latinopia. So I guess uh, if I were to ask myself, Jesus, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, I would have to say that uh, I just want to be remembered uh, for my commitment to 
our larger uh, Latino community and the larger human race and, and acknowledging that all my creativity and all the projects I worked with uh, were to make this a better world and I've hoped that I've been successful uh, in helping make it a better world and improve the lives of others. And I think there's a great deal of um, merit and, um, you know, uh, to be taken from that. I think it's something that all of us uh, should strive for and uh, be able to, to say, yes, I, I made this world a better place. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. It was... Well, thank you. Thank you guys, too. Thank you. So what, what secrets were you telling her in these notes? <laughs> oh, just uh, sometimes I came up with, with, uh, with questions, uh, follow-up questions or, or ideas on, on, on what to, where, where to take the conversation. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're still rolling, right? Yes. Earlier you had asked the question, what advice would I give to, to younger generations? I don't think I quite finished, uh, I quite answered that. So, so I, I would like to just kind of respond. Um, you know, after so many years of filmmaking and writing, uh, producing, um, I look at the younger generation and I say, you know, what is your future and how do you break into the industry and what is it that you do for yourself and for others? And, and I would say that uh, my advice to, to them is uh, to the younger generations who are uh, trying to make a career of filmmaking or television or writing is that um, uh, you must be tenacious, uh, you must have a vision, uh, you must be willing to be hard-shelled and, no uh, and not take no for an answer, uh, you must be willing to uh, possibly endure times of hardship economic hardship, uh, personal hardship, uh, but you must be driven by a goal. You must have your eyes on that prize uh, and you must be clear about what that is in terms of fulfilling your personal happiness and the contributions that you want to make and the creativity you want to express. And um, I think it's important for everyone to spend some time figuring that out, deciding for themselves, what really am I about? What, what do I really want out of life and out of my career? And do I really want to be a writer? Do I really want to be a director? You know, not everyone is destined to be anything. It's something that you embrace yourself. But before you embrace it, you better damn well be sure that it's something you want to do, you want to pursue, and that you're willing to pay these prices of the tenacity, of the hardships, of the, of the possible failures um, that you want to do before you undertake those. So that would be my advice, to, uh, to be prepared uh, for the hardships, to be prepared to be tenacious, and to not lose sight of that goal that you've set for yourself. Okay, good. So here are the notes. All the questions more... Um, Vinicius comes from this school, so he was more interested in questions of how the film makes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, you know, yeah. I was yeah. kind of yeah, overlooking good, good, yeah, those yeah, kind yeah. of questions. Yeah. 